All right, everybody, it's 10 o'clock, so we're going to get started. My name is Eric Hayden. I'm a meteorologist with the Weather Service in Moorhead City, North Carolina, joined by Sarah Spiegler. She's going to be talking uh, about climate change and some of the impacts in our area. And I really want to thank uh, Dr. Barb Bostead. Uh, she's a meteorologist that works out in Norman, Oklahoma now. Uh, she's moved up through the ranks and her specialty was a lot about climate. And I appreciate her sharing these slides because as a meteorologist at the local level, my focus is out to seven days. I am not a, a climate expert by any stretch of the imagination. That's why we have Ms. Sarah on with us. And that's why we have the slides from Dr. Barb. Uh, she's done an outstanding job and a lot of her weather climate slides are something we're using here uh, today. So really appreciate uh, that information. I'm the warning coordination meteorologist here in Moorhead City. My main job is the liaison between the community and the weather service, a uh, community outreach and preparedness. Ms. Sarah, why don't you talk a little bit about what you do? Thanks, Eric. Can you hear me okay? We can. Hey, everyone. I'm here at home, working from home. Um, I'm really excited to be here today, and I want to say thank you to Eric for inviting me. I always enjoy working with the Weather Service and um, helping Eric with these classes. Um, like Eric said, my name is Sarah Spiegler, and I work for North Carolina Sea Grant. I'm headquartered in our Moorhead City office at our NC State Marine Lab. And I'm the coordinator of the North Carolina Sentinel Site Cooperative and also a marine education specialist for North Carolina Sea Grant. So in my job, I work collaboratively with a lot of partners around the state of North Carolina, including Eric and the Weather Service. And I provide information about the impacts of sea level rise on coastal habitats and communities here in coastal North Carolina. So I do a lot of trainings, workshops, and hosting partner meetings. And again, I'm really excited to be here today to talk to you all. And just so everybody knows, the format's going to kind of go back and forth between Ms. Sarah and myself to kind of break things up. This first part, we're going to lay the groundwork for who the Weather Service is. Since this is a climate change talk, we're going to go through this pretty quickly. Our main mission in the Weather Service is uh, protection of life and property. We issue watches, warnings, and advisories for that. And we have a lot of offices across the country. Here locally, we cover Eastern North Carolina, but I know we have a lot of folks on this presentation from all over the country. We actually have over 100 forecast offices across the country itself to serve you. And a big part of that is knowing the area, uh, living in the area, and being able to fine tune that forecast uh, based on where we live. As far as we're concerned, we cover Eastern North Carolina. So if you've ever been to the Outer Banks, up toward Greenville or down toward Jacksonville, we cover those areas shaded in yellow. We are responsible for the waters out to 20 nautical miles. So if you've done any uh, boating, if you've been to the beach, been on the local rivers, uh, we do a marine forecast for those uh, areas as well. We are open tw uh, 24 hours a day, 365 days of the year. Uh, this is our staff during Hurricane Florence. Uh, we are staffed to stay in the building no matter what. Uh, it's a reinforced building that's located high and we stay when the weather gets bad. 24-7 uh, to serve you. The main way you can get information is from our website. If you just remember weather.gov, anywhere in the country, if you go to weather.gov, click on the part of the country you live in, that will take you to the local office. For us, it's weather.gov slash Newport. You can click anywhere on this map or enter your city or zip code in the upper left to get a detailed forecast. And the forecast itself will be a seven-day forecast. It'll tell you you know, how warm or cold will it be? Uh, what is the chance for rain? If you scroll down the page, uh, there's a much more detailed forecast called an hourly graph. You can see the marine forecast, a lot of information on the website. So if you remember anything out of this beginning of the talk, weather.gov for your forecast need. As you scroll down the page, we do do weather briefings. At the bottom of the page, there's a whole bunch of icons. If you click on weather hazard briefing during active weather, you'll see something like this. The example on the left is during Hurricane Florence. The example on the right is during a recent winter storm. So if it's a day like today, clear blue skies out, you're not gonna see anything on this website for the briefings. If there's an approaching hurricane, winter storm, or severe weather, uh, you'll see a weather briefing on our site. Please follow us on social media, YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. Just search NWS Moorhead City. The reason for that, we post a lot of great information. This is our avenue for telling you what you should focus in on and kind of dive down into the most important details. On social media for itself, on YouTube, uh, this presentation will be recorded and hosted on the website itself. Lastly, a lot of times we get questions about our app. 
We don't have an app, but we have a mobile site. It's mobile.weather.gov. You can use this on your smartphone. You can use this on your personal computer. If you just go to mobile.weather.gov on your smartphone, whether it's an iPhone or an Android, if you save it to your home screen, you'll have a little weather service icon and you'll be able to get detailed forecasts very, very similar to what you would have uh, with a, a real app. All right, so that's kind of the homework, Ms. Sarah. We talked about you know, who the weather service is, who you and I are. If we're gonna talk about climate change, we first have to talk about what is climate. And Ms. Sarah's gonna talk a little bit about that. Thanks, Eric. So yes, I'm gonna talk about weather and climate and how they are the same and how they're different. Um, so it's very important to understand the difference between weather and climate. And especially in my job, um, where I work on sea level rise and climate change, it's important to have that basic understanding of how weather and climate are different. So today, if you look out your window, I'm looking out, I'm in my home office right now, working from home. And I look out my home, my um, office window, and it looks sunny and not too windy. And I know, because I went for a walk this morning before I started working, that it was about, I'd say 65 degrees. I had to put a sweatshirt on, it was a little cold. Um, I say that, my parents live up in Ohio and they're probably hating me right now for saying that. Um, so if you think about weather, that is, what is the temperature outside right now? Is it windy? Is it cloudy? Is it raining right now? Um, so right now here in North Carolina, it's pretty nice and sunny. I know a couple of weeks ago, I was talking to my parents and it was snowing up in Ohio. The weather was cold and snowy. Now, if you think about climate, that's different than weather. Climate is what is the average weather condition over a long period of time. So when I say long period of time, I'm talking about years generally 30 to 40 years, what is the average weather condition? Sometimes even more, maybe 50 to 100 years or more. So if you think about a place like a desert, the climate there is usually hot and dry, so very low precipitation. So it might rain one day in the desert, but over 30 or 40 years, there's usually not very much rainfall. And so that's what we call climate, the average weather condition over a long period of time. So in summary, thinking about weather versus climate, again, weather happens at a particular time and place and climate is more regional and long-term. So a couple of analogies that Eric and I like to use when we're thinking about weather and climate is, what is the weather? Is It's sort of like the news, whereas climate is like history. And another really great example I like to use is, what's my outfit today? T-shirt, I had to put a sweatshirt on, but what do I have up in my closet? What do I wear over the whole year? What's the, what is my average um, uh, wardrobe? So those are some good ways to think about weather and climate. All right, great job, Ms. Sarah. And sometimes we talk about personalities, you know, what our personality mm -hmm. is, is what we usually are, our average, but sometimes we have a bad day, we're in a bad mood, that would be our weather, which can be much more changeable. So very, very good uh, job with that. So we talked a little bit about what climate is, now I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, climate outlooks that the Weather Service actually does, and then we're going to start to uh, tiptoe our way into what climate change is. So as far as climate prediction, we as the Weather Service have something called the Climate Prediction Center. If you go to the website down below, uh, you can find these forecast maps. I should mention that after this class, we'll do a follow-up email with all these links we're talking about. So you can jot it down or just kind of wait for the email from us that you registered for. So this is a, a climate prediction for temperature and uh, rainfall on the right. And these are odds or probabilities that it's gonna be warmer, colder, wetter, or drier than normal. And this is average over longer periods of time. So maybe not 30 years like Sarah was talking about with climate, but it's not a daily forecast. This is a six to 10 day forecast, uh, a monthly forecast or seasonal forecast. And we're gonna talk about uh, what these maps represent. One of the best ways to uh, view it is these are forecast um, parameters that are divided into thirds. Uh, a lower third would be below normal, the middle third would be near normal, and the upper third would be above average. So whether it's temperature or uh, rainfall, it's divided into thirds. And whenever you 
see these maps, uh, they have percentages on them and they have darker colors. So on the lower right, this is a temperature map, 70% chance below normal across the central part of the country. This is an eight to 14 day outlook. And your eyes are drawn to this red shading in the Pacific Northwest, a 70% chance of above normal. What that means is, it doesn't mean that it can't be average or um, below normal in this case for the Pacific Northwest. It just means the probability is much, much lower. So the example in the upper right kind of explains this. Uh, this is an 8 to 14 day forecast. Notice the blue shading. So you probably infer that it's a, a higher chance for below normal temperatures. And that's right. But again, it, it's just a probability. It doesn't mean that uh, you can't have warm temperatures. So the graph in the upper left means for this point, uh, just to the east of Kansas City, it's a 77% chance that it's going to be below normal during that period. Very, very high probability. More than likely, it's going to happen. You take your percentage out of the above normal, it's very, very low that it's going to be above normal, and uh, only a 20% chance of near normal. It's very hard to explain. The best way to do it is when your percentage is really high, your probability in one category, you're going to be taking it away from the others, but not completely. So what that means on these maps, this represents a pretty high probability that's going to be below normal with less of a chance to be near or um, above average temperatures for then. So it's tricky to explain. What I tell people is if you look at these maps and the percentages are near 33 to 40 percent, that's roughly a third for anything. That, doesn't, that, that means there's no strong signal for above, near, or below normal. Until you get up to 50, 60, 70%, that's when you really should focus in on that, hey, my probability is pretty high for that to happen. Hopefully you got that. Every time I explain it, it's very difficult. All you need to get out of that is that the probability is very high. That's when those maps can be quite useful. When we make long-term forecasts, we're looking at a lot of climate features, things like El Nino and La Nina, you may have heard of. You may have heard of the North Atlantic Oscillation. Um, El Nino, that type of pattern would not be favorable for hurricanes in our neck of the woods. So we look at these long-term or longer-term types of climate patterns uh, to kind of tip our scales into knowing what's gonna happen for the next couple weeks or months. Now, if we don't have very, very strong signals such as an El Nino or La Nina, uh, then our confidence is not really high and we may not have strong signals either way. So most of our climate forecasting in the weather service is six to 14 days and maybe a seasonal forecast, but not much beyond that. When we're talking about climate change, we're talking about a long, long period of time. Uh, Ms. Sarah mentioned you know, 30 years is what we usually use for an average uh, for weather. So we're not talking weeks at a time. And you may notice that the terminology has changed over the years. Sometimes people still refer to global warming. That's not really the, the best way to describe it. And the reason for that is our climate is changing, but it doesn't mean that everybody's warming. You'll see through this presentation that some parts of our world are actually cooling. So climate change is a much more accurate descri description because the climate is changing. And for some folks that might mean warmer weather, it might mean more drought, it might mean more flooding, and for some of you, it might mean warmer weather, it just depends. Uh, so climate change is a more appropriate term in terms of what we're talking about. Be real careful about your information sources. Everything that Ms. Sarah and I are talking today is science-based um, research uh, through either the Weather Service or other uh, governments. So this is all based on science. Um, you can take with it uh, what you want. Um, there are some people that talk about climate that are not trained in it. I am not trained in climate, just a teensy bit through the Weather Service. So that's why I'm leaning on resources like Ms. Sarah, Dr. Barb, I mentioned in the beginning, she has a PhD in this uh, area. So we lean on the experts uh, to explain it a little bit better. And the good analogy is, you know, would you go to the dentist for heart surgery? No, you, you go to the experts that know, um, and that's where this information is coming from. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about climate change. And a lot of you have probably heard about this. I'm gonna use Ms. Sarah's analogy for this because we just went over these slides and I liked it. Um, the graph on the left or the picture is the greenhouse effect. That's a good thing. We wouldn't be able to inhabit this earth if we did not have the greenhouse effect. That's keeping us at a climate that we can live in. What naturally happens is the sun, um, the radiation heats the earth itself, and then the earth in tune heats the air just above it. 
Now, some of that heat escapes out into the atmosphere. That's a natural process. But some of it, because of this ozone layer here, this, uh, the greenhouse gases, uh, things like carbon dioxide and water vapor, it actually traps some of that heat in our atmosphere and bounces it back down to the earth. So again, kind of think of it like a loose, thin blanket. Ms. Sarah came up with this or has heard this. So that's natural. That's a good thing. The greenhouse effect is not a bad thing. The problem is, we are enhancing it. And the way we're doing that is we're adding a lot of carbon dioxide and other things such as methane, nitrous oxide, um, into the atmosphere. So this layer, this um, ozone layer, is much, much thicker, um, like a thicker blanket, and it's trapping more heat in our atmosphere. So again, the greenhouse effect itself is a good thing, but by releasing all these gases and more greenhouse gases, um, that blanket or that layer is much thicker, and we're um, trapping more of the heat and we're warming up. And we're gonna show you some graphics that you might be familiar with, just kind of, how do you, how do I know this? You know, how do I know that carbon dioxide is increasing or, um, you know, and we're gonna show you uh, scientific proof that things are increasing. And then with our own eyes, we can see things that are happening on our earth. So this is a pretty classic graphic. Uh, we started measuring, um, carbon dioxide um, at observatory, and I think it's out in Hawaii. This, I think it's Hawaii. Um, and in the 1960s, these are parts per million on the graph on the, the, the left, the y-axis, and the x-axis are the years going forward. So we started out about 300 uh, parts per million of carbon dioxide at this one location in the atmosphere. And you can see through the years, uh, here we are 2020, it has increased to above 400 parts per million. So in recorded history, at least back to 1960, we can prove that um, carbon dioxide is increasing. Then if we want to go back farther into time, we didn't have observations uh, like we do since the 19th. 1960s. So we have to look at things like ice cores. And when we look at those ice cores, we can measure how much carbon dioxide was present in them. Uh, so again, the graph on the left is showing parts per million, uh, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So 200, 300, 400 is your scale. And the graph on the bottom, the x-axis is going from present day, which is zero, 100, 200, 300, 400,000 years in the past before we had thermometers, and ways to record uh, temperature and, and things like that. We're using the ice cores. And you can see there is natural variability. So uh, we were roughly around 200 or three, a little bit less than 300 parts per million, but occasionally we did drop below 200. So there was natural variation. The, the amount of carbon dioxide through the years has varied. But you'll notice through all the ups and downs, recently we're very, very high. We're up, uh, I'll show a graph up above 400 parts per million. So we have varied in the past, um, but we are much, much higher than we have been in the last 400,000 years based on recorded history, either true observations or the ice cores themselves. We can go back even a little bit farther and show that this also correlates to periods of warming and cooling. So a lot of times you'll hear people say that the climate has naturally changed through the years. Yes, that's 100% right. Our, our climate has varied even before we were here. And we can show that, uh, again, the blue line represents the parts per million for carbon dioxide, and it fluctuated roughly between 150 and 300 parts per million. You can see we had some peaks, and during those peaks, we had warm periods, interglacial period. We had dips, and that's when we had the glaciers. So all of that is natural. We've had warm spells, cool spells. We've had increases and decreases in carbon dioxide. But on this graph, again, toward the end, which is now, or recent, um, our average in 2018 was 407. So that was high, higher than our previous high, which was around 300 parts per million. So we know carbon dioxide is increasing. Uh, we can tell by actual measurement, and we can tell by ice cores going back hundreds of thousands of years. Um, carbon dioxide gets a lot of the news in terms of greenhouse gases, but there are other gases that make up the greenhouse effect in, in um, the, the layer itself. There's methane and nitrous oxide. Uh, those aren't talked about as much, but um, we can measure that in, in the past as well, and those are also increasing. So the whole point is greenhouse gases are increasing. They have increased and decreased in the past, but we've never seen this rapid jump that we have uh, recently. 
some of the impacts that we have seen, global temperatures, we know those are increasing. So again, we're talking about known things that we can measure, that this is known, this is scientific um, you know, fact. Uh, going to the, um, the, this graph shows anomalies in degrees Celsius. If you're above this axis, the red area, that's showing a warmer anomaly. If you're blue or below the graph, that's showing cooler anomalies. And we go back to 1880, so roughly through the 1930s, we had a lot of cold years. Um, and again, this is global. This is not just in your backyard or your city. This is over the whole world. Uh, this is land and ocean temperature. And you can see through the 40s and 70s, we had some warm years and cold years. Uh, but recently, since about 1980, we've had uh, the anomaly itself has been positive or warm. Uh, and this is probably the most obvious change that we've seen. Again, um, this is what led to the term global warming. On the whole, the, the temperature of the ocean and land is warming, but it's called climate change because that warming will have different impacts uh, on you. It won't all be just about warm temperatures. So in the Weather Service, we use um, models. We forecast out to seven days, and that's our expertise. There's also global climate models that predict where we're gonna go for a temperature. And with any model, if it stinks in the beginning, it's gonna stink at the end. You need to have a good base is for what's happening now. So we as scientists are constantly looking at the now. Is It's a sunny day, Miss Sarah. Is, is the computer model I'm using to predict tomorrow saying it's sunny? If it's saying it's going to rain today, it's garbage. So we always try to correlate it with what's happening now. And the same thing with the climate models. This graph represents the observations um, in terms of global temperature. And the black line is what is has been observed since 1900. So you can see the black line is going up. When we use our models and we factor in only natural factors, that's this green area. It matches up pretty well through the 1940s, but notice as we get toward uh, the 2000s, the green model only using natural factors would suggest we should be cooling or cooler than we are right now. When we use the model that factors in natural and human factors as denoted by the blue, it also does well in the 1920s and 30s, but it is the closest match to what is reality, which is observations. Um, so therefore, we are contributing to what's going on right now based on the science of observation and the science of matching it uh, with what is actually happening. Don't just take it from me. Uh, we're a large society in the world. We have a lot of people that are working on climate change. It's not just one agency or one person. And this graph shows that. Uh, this is NOAA, NASA, which is the United States, uh, UK, so um, Britain, and the NOAA itself uncorrected. So these are just showing um, different models. So, you know, don't put all your eggs into one basket is what this is saying. And what the models showed, um, again, we had some cooling um, back in the late 1890s, early 1900s, uh, but there was not a lot of good correlation back then. Um, when you don't have a lot of information, things can kind of be out of whack, and that's what those this part of the graph is showing. But as we get toward present time, we're, we're able to measure our atmosphere much more uh, accurately. Notice how the spread amongst the models gets tighter. That leads to more confidence, and they're all showing that, that we're warming up. So, um, you know, just to reiterate, carbon dioxide and getting greenhouse gases are increasing. That's something that we can measure. Uh, it's increasing at a rate that we have never seen before. Um, and overall, the globe, the, the world itself is warming. It's been correlated with observations and then a statistical analysis as well. All right, enough of me. We want to get to the, the best presenter here. This is why we have Ms. Sarah on here. Uh, so we showed you that carbon dioxide's changing. We showed that, sh that, that we're warming, Ms. Sarah. But sometimes people can't see that, that, yeah, yeah, it seems warmer, but I don't know, North Carolina, you know, I'm from uh, upstate New York, you're from Ohio, it, it seems warmer here just because we're in North Carolina. Miss Sarah's gonna talk about other visuals that are happening in our community now that will kind of show that we're already seeing some of those uh, symptoms of climate change. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Thanks for that really great summary of um, how the climate is changing. That was That was really good, thank you. Um, so like Eric said, um, how can we tell, how can we see it, you know, in our own communities, in our own backyards? So Eric did a really good job of talking about global climate change, what's happening, you know, the average um, changes around the world. I want to talk to you today a little bit about what's happening here in North Carolina. Um, so I'm going to start with the basics 
um, about sea level rise. So I also want to talk about so some of the symptoms of climate change include sea level rise. Um, also things like ocean acidification, icebergs melting. Um, we have more intense storms and also greater rainfall. Um, so I'm going to show some examples of some of those here in North Carolina. Um, so sea level rise. Many of you probably know that that is because our glaciers are melting and because as water warms up, it takes up more space. So that's the concept of thermal expansion. Um, so that is why sea level rise is occurring on a global scale. Um, but if you think about um, the local impacts, sea level rise is, is rising here in North Carolina because of the glaciers melting because of um, thermal expansion, but other things um, impact sea level rise on a local level too. So things like erosion, the regional ocean currents and um, winds, how land is moving um, in response to the weight of the Ice Age glacier. So that is impacting um, regional areas. So thinking about here in North Carolina, um, um, sorry, can you go back one slide, Eric? Sorry about that. So that is Beaufort, North Carolina, that photo. That is right down the street from where I live. And you can see the water levels increasing into the marsh areas. So we may say that globally, sea level rise is increasing at a rate of three millimeters per year. But what is happening? What is the relative sea level rise in North Carolina? So now, Eric, you can go forward a slide. Sorry about that. Okay. So thanks. So in Beaufort, North Carolina, we call it the relative sea level rise. So Global sea level rise is different than relative sea level rise. So you can think of the relative sea level rise as what's happening in your region. So here where I live in Beaufort, North Carolina, we have a NOAA tide gauge that every six minutes records the water levels, which is really cool. And if you can look at that um, figure, they've been recording water levels here in Beaufort, North Carolina since 1950, every six minutes for the most part. Um, and then on the y-axis you can see the increase in meters and so the the trend i see here in my hometown in beaufort north carolina is that water levels are increasing at 3.22 millimeters per year so if we look at that trend um, over the next 100 years that could mean that we're going to see an increase of one foot of water um, here in beaufort so if you can go to the next slide eric so one foot, that doesn't seem like too much, right? But that is an aerial view of my hometown of Beaufort. And on the left, you can see the Rachel Carson Reserve. Yep. And then on the right, you can see the town of Beaufort. So if you think about it, there's already a ton of water around here. And if you increase levels one foot, that's gonna make, that's gonna change a lot of our habitats and it's gonna start impacting our communities as well. So here in Beaufort, so I'm in the pretty much the um, eastern part of North Carolina, so south, actually, yep, right down there. Um, but the northern part of North Carolina, where we have the Outer Banks and where we have Alligator River National Wildlife Refuge, that is actually the most susceptible to sea level rise in the state of North Carolina. And um, if you go forward a slide, Eric, you'll see Oregon Inlet, the increase of relative sea level rise is over five millimeters per year. So that could mean all, almost two feet in the next 100 years. And if you think about our low lying barrier islands in the Outer Banks, that's a lot of water um, that's going to change our habitats and our communities there. So this graph shows. Um, the projected increase in mean sea level. And so this is important because we just showed you that in Beaufort, North Carolina, we're predicting three millimeters of sea level rise um, per year. The problem is what if that rate starts increasing? And what if we get not one foot of sea level rise in the next 80 years, but what if we get two to four feet of sea level rise? So I showed, what do you think one foot of sea level rise in Beaufort would look like? Well, what if we get two to four feet of sea level rise? And that could happen if our greenhouse gas emissions continue to go up. And so each of those curves show um, different scenarios with different greenhouse gas emissions. So the very highest one, the extreme one on the top, the red one, that's if you know we continue to increase our greenhouse gas emissions, um, we could really see a huge change in sea level rise. 
And so what does, again, what does that mean here for Beaufort, North Carolina? So that graph just showed, you know, what if we have that extreme scenario? Hopefully that's not gonna happen, but what if we do? What if we have eight to 10 feet of sea level rise? Well, right now our marshes, they like it when they get more water in, it brings more sediments, it helps them build um, their marsh habitats. But what if you have, you know, even five feet of water over those marshes? They're gonna disappear. And those marshes provide many important ecosystem services for our communities and for our economies here in North Carolina. So on top of sea level rise, we also are seeing that we're going to have more minor um, flooding in our communities. So minor flooding, you may have heard it called nuisance flooding or sunny day flooding, or sometimes we're calling it high tide flooding now. So this shows that right now we have less than 50 days with this um, high tide flooding in our communities. However, again, if we continue to emit um, greenhouse gases at the rate that we are right now, we could have many more days of high tide flooding. Um, and here in Beaufort, North Carolina, it shows that at the extreme scenario, you know, we could get up to 350 days of high tide flooding per year. Um, hopefully we stay in one of those low scenarios um, because minor flooding, while it can be a nuisance, Eric, you can go to the next slide. So it can seem like a nuisance. You know, you can't drive your car down the road when we have um, this nuisance flooding. Maybe you, you kayak down the road instead, that can be fun. But think about all those stores that can't open or the cars that can't reach those stores. People can't go to work, they can't go to school, they can't go buy things. So, you know, if it happens a couple days a year, we can adapt to it. But if it starts happening 50, 100 days per year, that's gonna cause a lot of changes in our society. And then on top of sea level rise, like I said, we are going to see more intense, we're already seeing more intense storms, we're already seeing greater rainfall. So a study by a researcher at UNC Institute of Marine Sciences here in Moorhead City found that six of the seven highest per precipitation events on record here in North Carolina have occurred within the last 20 years. So basically we're getting more intense storms and we're getting more rainfall. And that photo, um, I guess it's only been two years since Hurricane Florence, but that is um, right after Hurricane Florence in New Bern, when we had the historic flooding um, in New Bern. So we've all already experienced these impacts of climate change here in North Carolina. All right, Ms. Sarah, well, we really appreciate it. I think, you know, you talk about carbon dioxide, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of years. That's hard to relate, but those pictures of, you know, you kayaking in Beaufort, that's relatable. We have, you know, sunny day um, nuisance flooding, you know, uh, those types of things. Uh, the next part of the talk, we're going to talk about how we can see this um, all over the world and in our country itself. So we talked a lot about uh, those different aspects um, in terms of how we can actually see that. Uh, so there's actually many indicators. Um, Ms. Sarah talked about this a little bit, but uh, melting glaciers, uh, less snow cover, less sea uh, ice, all that is going into the, the ocean itself and helping it rise. Uh, but there's other factors you might not realize. And again, this is why we're talking climate change and not just global warming. Uh, we got a good question in here. What's the difference? Again, global warming is that the, the earth by and large, uh, overall, the when you average everything out, we are warming. Uh, the, the difference is climate change is because of that, things will happen differently um, in, uh, on the earth itself. Some places might cool, some places might have drought. Uh, so that's the difference there. And, and a lot of times you don't hear about that there's an increase in humidity, increase in sea surface temperature. Those can all lead potentially if the weather factors line up for more intense storms. We saw that with Florence in terms of the rainfall. Uh, so there's a lot of factors that we can see over the world that are either increasing or decreasing as a result of climate change. Um, one thing that's affected is the average itself, the extremes. So the graph on the left is our normal, uh, let's say temperatures, probability of occurrence. Uh, you have an average, which is the most likely outcome. You have a hot extreme and you have a cold extreme. That, that is normal. With climate change, that normal and new climate shifts to the right. So you tend to have more hot weather, more record hot weather, and more drought. Uh, and your average has shifted to the right. So your long-term average, your overnight lows, things like that tend to be warmer. One really important thing that we have not mentioned uh, yet, it means that you have less cold weather. It does not mean that you don't have cold weather. So when Miss Sarah was talking 
talking about climate. It's over a long period of time. If we get a snowstorm this January and we're in the single digits for temperatures like we were back in 2018, that doesn't mean that climate change isn't happening. You're still going to get cold. You're still going to have snowstorms. No one storm means that this is happening or it's not happening. On the reverse side with like Hurricane Florence, climate change doesn't mean that all storms will be bad. It just means the probability is there for it to be more likely. In our class that Dr. Barb taught, and I went through training out in Kansas City, I really like this analogy. Um, let's say you play the lottery and you have uh, lottery balls. A hundred of them are painted white. And of those, uh, on a normal basis, 15 are painted red. And that represents your probability of an extreme rain event, extreme temperature event. 15 out of the 100 are painted red on a normal, you know, let's say this, this graph on the left. With climate change, now your red balls may increase to 25 or 30. So it just means your probability for those things to happen are higher. You can't relate any one storm directly to climate change, but because of the, the earth is changing, your probability for some of those extremes uh, does increase. The example on the lower right, you have a higher probability for more heavy precipitation um, than a no, in a normal situation. Again, doesn't mean that you can't have um, you know, extremes like drought, and, and in this case, um, the both extremes are higher. We have a higher probability for droughts and a higher probability for more flooding, so the extremes for precipitation uh, have increased. This is a temperature trend compared to um, 1901 to 1960, um, recent up through 2012. Temperatures, for the most part, have warmed uh, across America. Uh, the highest extremes have been in the west and the northern plains. Uh, but this gets to what I mean that not everybody's warming. Um, temperatures have either remained negligible in terms of change or slightly cooled in the southern part of the country. So again, um, overall, the globe is warming, but it doesn't mean that everybody will warm up uh, with climate change. Another thing we track is precipitation uh, trends. Ms. Sarah mentioned all the recent flooding we've had in the last 20 years in North Carolina. Overall, compared to the first half of the century, um, a lot wetter across the Northern Plains and the Northeast, and then drier in the, in the parts of the Southwest. And again, this is a long-term average year to year. If you have a hurricane and, and things like that, uh, things can certainly change. Uh, up north for ski resorts out west or up north where the economy uh, thrives on having snow cover, uh, snow melting early is a big issue. Um, this is a graph showing um, the number of um, um, snow melt in terms of how many days earlier it has happened, uh, going from 30 to 40 days. And the trend you can see, um, you know, showing that we've on average uh, melted snow a little bit earlier. And this is for the northern hemisphere. Uh, so earlier snow melt. Um, 20 to 30 days earlier across North America uh, in 2014 than the previous average. Um, this is showing snow extent uh, from 1967. Um, this is Northern Hemisphere, the coverage of snow. That's another way you can look at it. So you can look at it melting earlier, and then you can look at it in an aerial uh, type of view. Um, and again, you're going to have low years and high years. So there are extremes year to year. Uh, but what we like to look for are trends, trending you know, the same up or down. In this case, the extent uh, since 1967 has overall decreased. And again, you're going to have high years here in 2017, 2018. We did have some snowy years uh, in there. So it doesn't mean every single year is going to be less snow. It just means, again, when we're talking averages, we're talking about uh, long time frames. Arctic sea ice, Ms. Sarah mentioned this. Uh, there is a way that we can measure it, and this is just showing that it is decreasing. Um, the uh, 10 lowest minimum sea uh, ice extents have been in the last 10 years. Uh, so it's something measurable and something that we can see that the trend is for the sea ice itself to decrease. So decrease in amount of snow cover, decrease in amount of ice. As far as temperatures go, we really notice um, temperature disparities with minimum temperatures. So this is a graph showing the average minimum temperature across the whole United States uh, from 1901 to uh, 2000. On average, over our whole country, it's about 58 degrees, 58.4 uh, if you're keeping score at home. So that's what this gray line represents. That's our average temperature over that time frame. Um, the actual min temperature is shown by the blue graph, and you can see that we've had some years in the early 1900s uh, where we were below the average, and you can see recently we've had a lot of years above average. A lot of research has shown that 
our biggest temperature changes are actually occurring at night. We're not getting as cold as we once were. Uh, therefore, things like snow cover are not lasting as long. So climate change, there's a lot of things that focus on temperatures and negative impacts, not promoting climate change, but there are some, some of us that are going to benefit from uh, climate change. Ms. Sarah mentioned businesses hurting because of water rises. That's a negative. Frost seasons are extending. That could potentially be a positive for farmers. What this is, uh, frost freeze lengthening. You have a certain number of days. You, you have your killing frost uh, in the fall and you have your last frost in the spring. So from your spring to the fall, that's your growing season. Um, parts of the Northeast, it might only be 100, 150 days between your last frost in the spring, your first one in the fall. That's your growing season. It is expanding because our frost, um, you know, is arriving later in the fall, and that means our season is expanding. So on average, we're getting 10 extra days in the Northeast to as much as 20 extra days out toward the Southwest. Again, delaying the frost, extending our growing season. So we're able to grow for a longer season over most of the country. Tornado trends have shifted a little bit. Um, this is a map since 1979, and you can see the credit at the bottom uh, where there has been an increase. Um, if you're a big weather fan, you know that historically tornado alleys across the central part of the country, Nebraska, Kansas, Oklahoma, and Texas, uh, but since 1979, the researchers on the bottom have actually noticed that the increase in tornadoes has shifted a little bit east. Uh, some more of the Mississippi Valley, Ohio Valley areas from Mississippi, Alabama, northward up toward Kentucky, Tennessee, and Illinois, and maybe a slight decrease out toward Texas. So uh, very interesting with that. And that's why we mentioned climate change. It's not just all about temperature. It's about how we're changing. Two more slides on where we're going temperature-wise, and then Ms. Sarah is going to wrap it up uh, with some tools that you can see um, how, how this is going. And Ms. Sarah, we're doing really well on time. We're at 41 minutes, so we're, we're good to go. So the average temperature will warm across the region. These are projected cha um, the changes, and Ms. Sarah showed that graph where kind of the extreme and then the, the, uh, the lower end. Uh, so that's how this is divided. On the lower end, and by the mid 21st uh, century, so uh, looking 2036 to 2065, um, this map here, and then the last part of the century would be 2070 to 20, 2099. How hard to say all those numbers. So on the left, we're still talking uh, a degree or maybe two change in terms of our overall temperature in Fahrenheit in a least case or lower scenario. The example on the right, same time frame again. Uh, mid 2020, 2036 to 2065, and then the last half of the century could be as much as a six to eight degrees rise in temperature. And that goes back to Ms. Sarah's graphics. Um, if we keep increasing the greenhouse gases, if we keep going on this path, uh, we could be toward the higher scenario in terms of temperature. As far as what that means for precipitation, again, same time period. So I won't say it again because I was kind of tongue twisted the first time. Uh, as far as precipitation goes, um, the higher scenario, um, you know, we could see um, a, continue to see those increases uh, in the north, especially, and we've already seen that wetting trend up north, especially winter and spring, and the drying uh, trend down across the southern part of the country itself. So I'm going to, um, you're almost up. I'm just going to unmute you. We we're getting a little background noise, Ms. Sarah, so I muted you during mine. Uh, so a couple takeaway messages. It's real. Um, experts agree on this. Uh, it's mostly bad, but as you can see from the frost-free freeze example, and maybe uh, certain parts of the country will be more at risk. Maybe you're not as at risk uh, as you were before. So it, it'll depend on where you live, but it's certainly not too late to fix it. Um, we know what path we're headed down, but we can certainly help change that path. So as we wrap things up, think of questions you have for us. Ask them in the webinar itself, uh, and we'll get to those. Uh, but Miss Sarah's going to wrap things up with there's are some tools out there that you can look for your own eyes and kind of see what's going on. And then there's ways to get involved in your community uh, as a citizen scientist to uh, to observe the, the climate itself. Thanks, Eric. Um, so earlier we heard Eric say that it's really important to recognize where your sources of information are coming from. Like Eric said, if you need a heart transplant, you wouldn't go to the dentist. I think that was the example you used. So it's really important um, to recognize 
um, which sources um, you're getting your climate information from and to only um, go to trusted sources. And so I say that because with my um, work at Sea Grant, I help provide information to stakeholders and decision makers, local governments, about how to adapt to the impacts of sea level rise. And I always make sure to provide accurate information from trusted sources. And so I use a lot of different tools and resources when I'm sharing information. And one of the top go-tos, of course, is always NOAA. NOAA is a great resource for climate information. And one place that you can go is climate.gov. Um, Eric's got this graphic pulled up. Um, there's a, they have a global climate dashboard and they have lots of really great information um, at climate.gov when you're looking for your climate change resources. Um, and I think in the next slide, Eric, you have another example from NOAA. This is another part of NOAA um, that has a tool called the Climate Resilience Toolkit. This is also a really great tool. It has a lot of access to tools, information, subject matter expertise about how to build climate resilience in your community. So it's sort of like a clearinghouse of information from across different federal agencies. You can come to this one site and find out um, what other communities around the country are doing to build resilience to climate in their communities. Um, and so they have case studies. And Eric, if you go to the next slide. So I worked with the US Climate Resilience Toolkit about two years ago to develop this case study from NAG's head. Um, so NAG's head, as you all probably know, if you live in North Carolina, is up in the Outer Banks and it's very low lying. It's one of our, uh, it's on the barrier islands. And so they are definitely impacted by sea level rise, by flooding, by hurricanes. And so we developed this case study about how NAG's head is adapting to these coastal hazards, how they've included it in their land use planning. And that store, case story is um, published in the US uh, Climate Resilience Toolkit. And so you can go to this website to find out um, what communities around the country are doing that can help you um, when you're working with your own community to know what have people done before. Um, another great way to get involved, as Eric said, um, there are things that you can do is to get involved in a citizen science project. So we have a number of those throughout the state. We're gonna talk about two um, that I'm involved with and that Eric is involved with today. Um, the first is the North Carolina King Tides Project. Um, some of you may have heard of it. It's actually part of an international King Tides Project. So we have um, lots of states in the United States that have a King Tides Project and internationally, um, people are asked to go out and take photos of high water level events in their backyards and in their communities. And so we have these naturally occurring King Tides throughout the year where we have high water levels and often um, you know where the flooding is in your community. So we ask citizen scientists to go out and take pictures of these high water level events and then to post them on our website. And the idea is that you can go out and see what these high water levels events look like now in your backyard, but also start to visualize this is what it's gonna look like with sea level rise in the future. And so this is a great way um, to get out and to get involved with citizen science um, in your backyard. And then another citizen science project is called Coco Ross, and this is run by the Weather Service. Um, so I might let Eric give you a few more details, um, but basically you volunteer as a citizen scientist to measure precip precipitation. So it's similar to the King Tides. We're asking you to take pictures of high water levels. This citizen science project asks you to measure the precipitation in your backyard. Um, and Eric, I don't know if you want to provide a few more details about how to get involved. That's great. Uh, the best way, Sarah, is to go to that website, cocoaraws.org. And just as a reminder, as we wrap things up, all these links from climate.gov to the King Tides Project to Coco Raws will include in your email along with a certificate. Um, the I always say within a week you'll get a certificate and follow up from us. It just depends what I'm working on. But uh, hang tight. You, know, you can jot it down now. But yeah, the best way, uh, training, how to purchase the rain gauge, uh, all of that is on the website itself. And a shameless plug for our website on this Skywarn page you signed up for, we have recorded training for Coco Ross. So I think that's it, Miss Sarah. So um, those are our emails in the lower left. Feel free to send us an email uh, if you have you know something that comes up prior to then. Um, it, at this point, we're at about 10:50, so that's good. Uh, this is the first time Miss Sarah and I have done this, so we're 
trying to keep the length short, but when you're talking about 800,000 years of climate, it can, it can be difficult. Um,